Hello there, and welcome to this episode of Force Ghost Conversations. This is your host, Anthony King, and in this week's episode, I'm going to discuss the first episode from Ahsoka titled Master and Apprentice. Before we get started, I'm inviting you to join the conversation with us. We can be found on Twitter and Hive at Forest Ghost Pod. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok just by searching Force Ghost Conversations. Also, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on your listening side of choice. Plus, Force Ghost Conversations is live on Patreon. If you're a fan of the podcast and would like to consider pledging your support, there'll be an episode, uh, a link in the episode description for you to check out the various tiers offered. Finally, please be sure to check out our Tee Public Store to buy some Force Ghost Conversations mer- merchandise. And without further ado, it's time to gather around the campfire for some Force Ghost Conversations. All right, everybody, welcome back to Force Ghost Conversations. Yes, where we can finally talk about this this amazing show, Ahsoka. Now that the WGA strikes, the SAG after strikes, the guidelines have been lifted, and we can finally discuss the galaxy far, far away again. Plus, I didn't even mention this in the preamble, but you're getting a double bit of Force Ghost Conversations this week. Not only are we discussing Ahsoka Episode 1, but we're also going to talk about adjacent things to Star Wars, to Lucasfilm, to the galaxy far, far away. We're going to take a look at the first two trailers for Rebel Moon, one which came out, uh, I believe, like two months ago or something like that, which is the teaser. Um, obviously, we couldn't talk about it because of the strikes. And then the official trailer just came out last week, uh, during su- last Sunday, during uh, the NFL broadcast of the cowboys giants game i believe um so, so we're both gonna tackle both of those in this episode here so the ahsoka conversation will be first then we'll do a little brief intermission uh and then switch over to rebel moon talk for a little bit here towards the end i also want to apologize for a few things up front here you may have noticed my voice sounds a little bit uh lower or groggier than usual. Yes, I am a little under the weather. I got a little bit of a cold this week. So thank you for your patience in that front. If I need to pause to either sneeze or cough, thank you for your patience and understanding on that one in advance. Also, because of my illness, uh, I was also not able to put together a... Um, Cloud City Gossip, the news of the galaxy far, far away in Lucasfilm that we typically do week to week. And I know there was a lot, so I'll do my best in the next couple of weeks here to cover all that information appropriately. Um, I'm also recording these episodes in advance a little bit here because of the Thanksgiving holiday here in the United States. Um, So because of travel schedules and all that, I wanted to make sure that I had um, some episodes lined up and ready for you to go. So this episode plus uh, our the episode that will come out next week for those of you at home on Ahsoka episode two. Um, those will be done in advance. So there will be no Cloud City gossip for these two segments or episodes anyways. But when we get back uh, to business with episode three, we will certainly be having all of the news covered that we can really, that we can gather for the galaxy far, far away and Lucasfilm at that time. So thanks again for your patience and understanding when it comes to all that. We're still getting our sea legs back, if you will, and talking about the galaxy uh, of Star Wars and all that fun stuff again. So again, thanks for your patience when it comes to that. Whew, but we're here. We're finally here. We're at Ahsoka season. And it's interesting, too, because this is the first time for really for one of these Lucasfilm shows that we've talked about it a while after its release. Typically, when we would do one of these episodes, it's done, it's released the Sunday after it comes out. So let's say a show came out on Wednesday. I would have watched it when I got home from work on that Wednesday. Would have probably watched it again on Thursday and then once more on Friday and Saturday or Saturday with subtitles in order to collect and gather my notes and thoughts and then record either Saturday or Sunday morning, depending on my schedule, and then release the episode to you all. That's pretty. That's a pretty good timeline compared to other podcasters, right? A lot of them are releasing their episodes immediately after the episode drops. 
or the next day and they're watching it like four or five times so they're really ingesting it quickly so in my opinion that was that's what set us apart a little bit is that i was able to have some time and just let it meander i think that helped with my enjoyment of some of these series more than other folks too where they weren't just like forcing it down and then going to a microphone and talking about it um Whereas I kind of just got to sit and enjoy it and watch it a few times as a fan first before putting on a little bit of like a uh, a different hat, if you will. So with this one, it's 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 different in the fact that I'm rewatching these again months after it was first released. So in terms of sitting with it for a while. This is probably about the most time I've ever had before I went in front of a microphone since the start of this podcast two years ago, which is pretty cool. It's a different kind of thing. And I will tell you, you know, my thoughts have certainly changed. As a person that if you'd have put, I'm telling you now, if you'd have put a microphone in front of me immediately after some of these episodes this season... I may not have been as enthusiastic or, you know, understanding at the time. But I think understanding is a better word because some stuff just kind of went over my head. And I needed to sit with it and process it. What is my meaning for it? What do I take away from it? And I think that it really, this is going to be a great um, study for this in a way because because since I had time to kind of marinate with these thoughts and ideas, it's allowed me to appreciate the show a thousand times more. And I really love it so much because of that. So maybe this is just a life lesson overall, if you will. Take the time. <laughs> it's okay to not have an initial opinion and thought. And then it's okay to change that too. Now, I, I'm not saying that I, I was like the... I loved every episode to a degree. I really enjoyed them all as they came out. But then as I sat with them and watched them again a few times, and now that I'm redoing it for this, it's been taken to another step further, right? The shocks aren't necessarily there um, anymore, right? You know what's coming. I'm aware of the full story from start to finish. I can see the through lines in a way that my brain would have fixated on something before. And now I'm able to go back and go, oh, that doesn't bother me as much now. Or I really like that, how he did that. Oh, that's okay. You know, it's I, I find it to be much more healthier <laughs> in a way. So, you know, this show has been really great. It's been a wonderful time to get back into the swing of things with it all. And I hope that, you know, as you guys get to re-listen to this, um, perhaps you are... Uh, going on your own journey as well maybe re-watching the show with us here that'd be a lot really cool if you did that um but I, you know that's kind of where my thoughts are right now so thank you again for you know i said all that stuff at the top here but let's uh you know thanks for for being patient with us through the strikes and now we're finally here to talk about episode one master and apprentice which of course was as you can probably guess written and directed by none other than dave filoni right this show is his baby in many ways you know he's still working with john favreau and he has his influence on this and it's in the mando verse of stories that they're doing on disney plus but this has certainly got dave filoni's fingerprints all over it and the first thing that i really wanted to say is i loved that this episode was titled master and apprentice not only <laughs> and and this is again where it comes to like talking about the series overall as a whole is that we're introduced to Ahsoka at this point in time right we are we saw her in the Mandalorian season two we saw her a little bit in Book of Boba Fett and in those it alter interactions she said no to training Grogu she said no to staying with Luke and to helping him out in his in building his Jedi new Jedi temple. She's off on her own journey here, and in a way, she's really languishing here. And we understand a bit more of the why behind that in that. 
What we learn is that Sabine was taken on as an apprentice to Ahsoka. And the maybe it's the Mandalorian in her. Maybe it's the stubbornness of both characters. But it just doesn't work out. For a variety of reasons, probably. I think Ahsoka wasn't as patient. I think also Sabine wasn't as patient in trying to master her skills. And that friction caused them to go their separate ways, and it really complicated the relationship. Clearly, that exists in the episode still, too, here. They don't even necessarily want to talk to each other. I think in episode two, Sabine makes a great point that was I even a part of the plan if Hu, if Hu Yang could you even open up the 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 so they find that orb that basically helps find the map to where they're going to to launch off to find Thrawn and Ezra if they didn't know that if, if Hu Yang could open it would they've even come to see Sabine was she even a part of the plan <coughs> apologies there and that's a really great question. I don't think that Ahsoka would have. Ahsoka keeps saying that Sabine isn't ready. She never made an, a, an attempt to reach out again, right? The, the relationship's fractured. It's complicated. But this is a show called Ahsoka. And I think the question is, well, what's Ahsoka doing to make the relationship better? Is she being patient? Is she being compassionate? Is she being empathetic to Sabine in those instances? And that answer is probably no. So that's the first master and apprentice relationship that we're kind of starting here with. The other one that we're introduced here is Balin's Skull and Shin Hattie. Now, in this first episode, we literally have no idea what their thing is. We kind of know that Balin is a former Jedi. You kind of get that sense from him. I don't think it's explicitly stated here. It kind of is, actually, because the, the Hu Yang um, discussing of the lightsaber. He's got an apprentice named Shin Hadi. And they're Jedi, not Jedi, but Force user mercenaries, I think is the right way to call it. Now, I wouldn't say that they're light side users. I also wouldn't categorize them as dark side users as well. They kind of exist in a middle-ish, more leaning towards the dark side. But that's awesome, if you ask me. <laughs> I like that through the work that we've done with Clone Wars and seen in Rebels, is that... There's no monopoly to the Force. The Force isn't just black and white. It's not Sith and Jedi. We've seen the Bendu. <laughs> we see the Night Sisters, which big reveal that Morgan Elsbeth is a Night Sister or a member of the Night Sisters of Death. Be right. She's she's with that clan. The Force isn't just all of this. Ahsoka is a Force user, and she's not a Jedi. She makes that clear. I didn't use Jedi protocols in order to get the uh, information about where to find the location for uh, where Th Thrawn is at from Morgan Elspeth. That is so cool to me. I like exploring the concepts of all that. You know, it makes us question what the Force actually is. Are there different paths? What is the right path? These are some big philosophical questions that come and arise as a result of that. And they have a very interesting relationship thus far, Balin Skull and Shin Hattie. Balin certainly is some of the, you know, as a character, he's one of the most sure in a way. Like, he, he definitely has a lot of self-confidence, understanding of self-worth. He's got this grand plan that we're not privy to yet at this point about power. And that's why he's on this mission in a way. There's always a an ulterior motive to, to this. But they exist here, and they're another master-apprentice relationship. And they're probably... <laughs> One of the best examples of a master-apprentice relationship that I think we maybe have seen in Star Wars, which I think is, is also really cool to explore, which we will do throughout the season, of course. And the other master-apprentice relationship, 
obviously, is the overlooming one. <laughs> it is the Ahsoka and Anakin. Anakin Skywalker being the master, uh, an, an apprentice uh, with Ahsoka Tano. Which throughout the series is still something that sits with Ahsoka. When we saw her in Rebels, she learns that Anakin Skywalker became Darth Vader. She left him in Clone Wars. She walked away from the Order, and she saw him a few times before as the Revenge of Revenge of the Sith started. And I feel like she was blaming herself in a lot of ways for what happens to Anakin, that she maybe could have done something about it. She probably could have. I think Anakin was certainly reaching out and, and asking for help in a certain way without actually saying, please help me. And also, I'm not putting that on Ahsoka either. I think she needs to forgive herself in that regard. And to let go in a way. <laughs> but that certainly is, is something that goes into this series, right? We're going to talk about that relationship a lot more, particularly in episodes four, five, eight. So that master apprentice relationship is going to come into play as well because that plays into Ahsoka's languishing. She thinks she never got to finish her training. She's not a Jedi Knight. She doesn't follow these tenets and principles. She fears that she could have done something to stop Anakin, uh, to help him. She feels the failure of her relationship with Sabine, that maybe she's not a teacher. All of this is right here in episode one, which is so fascinating to explore. And I know that it gets convoluted uh, with, of course, the finding of Ezra and Thrawn and all this stuff. But that's the real heart of the relationships in this series to this point. Now, I want to talk about some of the other cool things, too, in this episode as well. Love the score. Kevin Kiner, this is really his first shot at Star Wars live action. And man, especially in this intro, with the, like the doom, 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 that that kind of drum beat, plus the end credits, the score throughout, obviously, <laughs> excellent, top tier, great Star Wars stuff. I like listening to both uh, volumes one and two in the on spotify so if you haven't done that yet be sure to go check those out to just listen to the pure music itself without um surrounding it with the 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 acting and the action etc all that stuff it's a great job mixing in rebels themes ahsoka's theme is very prevalent as well again i i'm gonna say that that end credit score is just really great dun, 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 dun. I mean, when we get to the Thrawn stuff later on in the later episodes with the organs, too, I mean, pulling that straight from Rebels, too, but adding that extra oomph to it, yes, 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 Kevin Kiner, all of the stuff, uh, all the good stuff, obviously, and he's knocking it out of the park, plus the team, I believe it's a family endeavor over there in the Kiners, uh, so great work overall for them. I love the red text crawl, too, when they're announcing, like, not that they're hunting for Thrawn as heir to the Empire, and and all of that stuff. Uh, I just thought that that was really cool. I like that there was a crawl to set this in a place and time to give it that grandiose fairy tale nature overall. It worked for me. It may not have worked for you all, but that's where I'm at when it comes to that. I and then, you know I talked a lot about the the Shin Hattie and Balin Skull uh, of it all already, but their intro was really great. That whole thing about them getting. Uh, Morgan Elizabeth off of that New Republic ship, which their security is not great at all. <laughs> um, that could certainly be better, and we'll talk about that in episode two. The the new whole New Republic of it all can just certainly be uh, upped a bit more um, in terms of, of their understanding of uh, solving the problems of inf an empire infiltrating them, uh, long live the empire, all that fun stuff. It, I mean... It, that's that's all not great, but their whole intro here of them just kind of taking out this entire ship is is really fantastic from a from a choreographed standpoint. Balen Skull is very menacing from the start. 
Um, I love that there's just general confusion as to who and what they are, that it certainly comes across in this episode in many ways. Um, and again, I talked about the concept of force users expanding and that there's not just one way to go about using the force. It makes sense in a real world uh, concept too, because like religions, um, we just have all of this in a, we, we, we have so many different ways of, of religion, but religions within religions, right? Uh, and, and no one has the right answers to anything. And they're just ways to go about living your life and, and, and ways to discipline and stuff like that. So it would make sense that the Force users, aside from just the Jedi and the Sith natural enemies of each other, that there's other ways of, along the scale, too, that maybe it's not such just two, a two-party system in a way, but maybe it's more of like a, a revolving circle which is the way that I like to review uh, political uh, ideologies as well. I appreciated the Raiders vibes, Raiders of the Lost Ark vibes uh, for those uh, at home uh, in terms of how Ahsoka gathers the orb. And of course, in true indie fashion, the system bites back. <laughs> um, it was just, I, I like that opening scene. I, I like that there's a constant thread too that in Dave Filoni's action sequences especially when it comes to lightsabers is that there's certainly an influence of samurai fighting if they're slow deliberate the act like the the weight of every movement is felt it's almost like a very choreographed dance where every step is poignant and and powerful um so even just lightsaber battles against uh assassin droids are are um definitely following through with that same formula to me, which I think is great. And that's a tenement really to how Filoni animates as well. Um, case in point, Star Wars Rebels does that a lot. So uh, really great to have that back again in, in this format. We got a lot of characters <laughs> in this series, in this first episode, especially that we haven't seen in live action before. Hera, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, literally embodies... Hera, I, <laughs> we joked a lot in our household, plus in our households with uh, my brother and sister-in-law about Hera, about her being quote unquote a wet blanket, right? Uh, that may be in, in Rebels, of course. I think certainly in Ahsoka, she gets to do a lot more. Uh, she's not just the mom telling everybody they can't do something in this series. She's more of a bridger of gaps, especially as she was uh, for Ahsoka and Sabine in this episode, trying to get them to reconnect it in a way. Their relationship could be could be better, but they have some places that they could start from, and she was helpful in getting them into positions and places by which they could can reconnect in a way with one each other with one another. We also got live action Lothal, right? The pivotal planet from star Wars rebels where all this takes place. You got to see the radio tower, Sabine, Sabine Wren, which we've already talked about. Um, Governor Azadi, the mural, Jai Krell, all the aliens of Lothal, the creatures, all this great stuff from Star Wars Rebels we finally got to see in a live action sense, which in my opinion worked really well. And we got to see some loath cats too. But aside from all that, there's also just some great relationships, like we we mentioned, like the Master Apprentice stuff. But we talked about that as well, like the languishing is going to be a big thing here. And that's something that just stands out to me here is that like, yeah, they have a purpose and meaning. Like clearly Ahsoka is like, I got to stop Thrawn. But I don't think she understands the why of why she wants to stop Thrawn. I think she just feels like a duty to do it, but there really isn't a motivation behind it. There isn't much driving force. She's not really stuck in a past, but she's not even living for a future, if you ask me. And that's something that I think will come to play throughout the episode as well. Again, every podcast has probably mentioned this before, but that rock music where Sabine is is uh, kind of running away from the ceremony on Lothal, 
It's very similar to the James T. Kirk intro from the 2009 Star Trek film. You might as well have had the Beastie Boys playing, to be honest. So, like, cool stuff there overall. And we got some new planets in this episode. We got Arcana, which is where the orb was found from the beginning. We also learn... um, Oh, that's all we get in this episode, because... uh, uh, Perdia is mentioned in the next episode. So scratch that one. That was just a note that I had or, you know, I watched these back to back. So I was combining a lot of the, the thoughts together on this one. So really, I mean. Really, it ends with like that fight between Ahsoka, not Ahsoka, but. Um, Sabine and Shin Hadi. Ahsoka can't figure out how to open up the Ahsoka and Huyang, for that matter, can't figure out how to open up, open up the orb. So they ask Sabine for help at Hera's request. Hera, uh, Sabine can't work under the conditions of having Ahsoka, you know, basically over her shoulder. <laughs> so she takes it back to her new home, which is the um, the radio tower that we see predominantly in Rebels, which was Ezra's home base for quite a bit. She's able to open it, but then assassin droids led by Shin Hadi um, destroy it. They take the information. Uh, well, they, they take the orb. They destroy the backups that Sabine had, and then Sabine and Shin engage in a little fight. Again, you get that Dave Filoni lightsaber choreography, which is great. And it concludes with Sabine getting stabbed by Shin Hadi. Sabine's lightsaber skills are not great. She's using Ezra's lightsaber. In episode two, she doesn't even call it her lightsaber, right? She has this reluctance to starting this journey as well. Um, Which is, you know, a great starting point off for all these characters, right? You got to start somewhere to have an arc over the course of the season. (laughs) And... You know, both of these episodes came out at the same time, so I think they were meant to be watched back to back. But really, was it ever a question that Sabine wouldn't survive to episode two? (laughs) Would they really kill off live action Sabine in the first episode? So, like, it was kind of funny when we watched it with my brother and sister-in-law. Right? Like, the shock was there for them in some way, at least for my sister-in-law, from what I recall. And... uh, She's like, are they going to do that? Is that really what's going to happen? And uh, my brother and I was like, do you think they'd kill her off? <laughs> Which is, again, was my line of thinking, too. Uh, so it was fun to just see, like, other reactions uh, to this to this episode, to the series. Like, did it have the effect that they were going for? And for in, in some instances, it appears like it did have that, have that impact there. Um, so obviously... Sh- I'm going to spoil it there. She makes it to the next episode, right? That's literally where it opens up. Like these were meant to be watched in a sequence together. They tell a complete story to go off on the hero's journey of it all. And that's where we'll really conclude with this episode, right? We talked about really where they are setting the stage. And this is what this episode does is just showcasing where our heroes at and our villains at, at this point, right? Our heroes are kind of at their lowest in a way, their weakest, And they're going to kind of stay there, too, for a bit as they grovel and and fight through some issues that they're going to have in the next couple of episodes until they finally start working through some of these problems that they've been refusing to deal with for quite some time. Meanwhile, our villains are certainly assured of where they're going. They're like, great power. We're going to do this. And they're confident and and almost casual in a way about how they go about it. (laughs) They have a clear goal in mind. The, our, our heroes are playing catch up at this point. And that's where we'll leave off for episode one. That was Master and Apprentice. Uh, our first episode, our first foray back into Star Wars, talking about it, having these great deep dive discussions, talking about the themes of it all. Um, so thank you so much for listening. And on the other side of this short break, we'll be back to talk about adjacent Star Wars, Rebel Moon. Yes, Zack Snyder's uh, foray into his modified version of a pitch that he did to Lucasfilm several years ago that Netflix has now taken under. And we are going to, of course, cover all that here at, uh, on, uh, Force Ghost Converse, Force Ghost Conversations. So on the other side of this quick little interlude, we'll be back to talk about the Rebel Moon. 
trailers. All right, stay tuned. Okay, everyone, I'm back. And uh, I've got water, and I've taken a little bit of a break to rest my voice here. Um, so I am now ready and refreshed to talk about Rebel Moon. Yes, I um, talked about it a little bit before we went into the little intermission there. And I could not be more excited for Rebel Moon. Yes, Zack Snyder is one of my favorite directors. I have loved just about every film that he's done to this point, at least the ones that I've seen. I know I haven't seen Owls of Gahul yet. Uh, but everything else, I have absolutely adored and loved. So you're telling me that this guy created a whole new universe kind of adjacent to Star Wars that, you know, inspired by the idea of Star Wars. Sign me up for it. And Netflix is also backing it up 110% with... Um, a PG-13 release and then a very hard R director's cut, like kind of similar to Zack style and all that stuff. If you are a fan of, of his work or at least knowledgeable to, to it. Um, and of course this is going to be part one, right? This is rebel moon part one child of fire, which is getting a part two, I believe in December. So part one comes out December 22nd. And then I think February ish is when part two comes out. It's getting like a, rpg video game it's getting some comic book tie-ins to kind of go about the characters a bit more i'm sure there's going to be probably some other stories in the rebel moon universe very soon here netflix is going all in on this so it gives me a lot of confidence as a fan um who appreciates this stuff and this is a brand new universe you're going to see some stuff that is kind of in the vein of star wars or at least the things that inspired it right seven samurai is obviously going to be right there at the forefront the kurosawa stuff um maybe some Western stuff, right? It's the DNA of what inspires Star Wars inspired this too. So I look forward to embracing this new universe, to seeing these new characters, to, to see what, what it is, what, what all this, uh, what the rebel moon is. Cause I'll be honest, I've kind of not been, I haven't gotten too in depth into it yet. I am going to take that deep dive very soon here, I know that there's been some variety articles about the characters and Zach's done a breakdown of the trailers uh, that we're, we're going to look at here in a bit. Um, so I'm going to fully digest all that stuff in due time. So with that, let's get to these trailers. I'm going to talk about or watch if you've done one of these trailers with us before. We're going to do two of them today, uh, obviously. So we're going to do the official teaser trailer, which you can find just by searching Rebel Moon trailer. It's from the Netflix channel. It's about three minutes, 42 seconds. So we're going to start with this one first here. So this is my, I don't I honestly haven't seen this since it came out a couple, two months ago. And I think I only watched it once and I was like, yeah, that's really great. Let's sign me up for that. But then uh, writer strike and, and sag after it. So I didn't really have a place to say, this is cool. I can't wait for this. Um, so let's dive into it again here. I'm going to hit play in, well, I'm going to allow you a chance to pull it up. If you want, pause the episode now. Uh, go to YouTube or your video site of choice and pull up Rebel Moon official teaser trailer and uh, get ready to join me here. So I'm going to hit play in five, four, three, two, one. Hit play. I see a hand. I believe that's Jimmy the robot over uh, kind of like a Justice League shot there princess isa i don't know who princess isa but i'm gonna find out in this in this series i bet you it's she was called the redeemer in myth interesting uh can any child stop the madness of war got that true snyder snyder stop motion Ooh. Oh, was that Jimmy talking about the robot? Loyalty to a king you can't serve? Interesting. That's a person out of time in a way. Can he save Princess Issa? Is that perhaps who Korra is? Is Princess Issa? I see someone banging a... a, a, a like the alarm call. He found her. Is that Princess Issa? Stargiver. Interesting. Out of war. All right. 
Hey, oh, looks like she has a lover that died. Love is weakness. Fighting for some like empire type thing. I believe that's Harmada, the fighter like villain who's the main villain of the entire Rebel Moon universe, from what I understand. There's Charlie Hunnam. Wow. <laughs> Who doesn't love getting crowned? Yeah, I'll say the visuals look great. Hey, Ray Porter. There's Dark Side. Yeah, definitely get some Seven Samurai vibes for sure. It's crazy how, like, this is like three minutes and yet I got really nothing. There's uh, Darian Bloodaxe, uh, Ray Fisher, one of my favorite actors out there. Like, this is literally like tip of the iceberg storytelling. It's like everywhere you turn, there's a brand new set of stories and universes and cultures and creatures. The king is a man, and the man can fail, but a myth is indestructible. Hey, I 100% agree. Maybe Jimmy is the is like the narrator of this, kind of like a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Definitely a teaser. That's for sure. We'll talk about that in a second here. I think it's about then. A lot of cool visuals. Rebel Moon. December 22nd, Part 1, Child of Fire. And then, oh, April. April 2024. I was like, February's too close. The Stargivers Part 2 in 2024, only on Netflix. Yeah, I was like, that. there's no way uh, that, that's coming out in February. I, know, I don't know where my brain was going with that one, so... Forgive me on that one. I messed up royally. Look, that's a great teaser. That's exactly what a teaser should do. It kind of just showcases cool visuals of the world. A little bit of the sense of perhaps what the story could be. I just definitely got seven samurai vibes from it all. Looks like whatever this empire is in this universe is trying to invade this planet for whatever reason probably natural resources and it looks like i believe the, the main character is named cora and she will have to band together who, who seems to be like a, a runaway from this military group um of, of the whatever this empire is is um putting together a band of rebels to protect this these people and you know, I was just thinking here as I'm watching through this, Jimmy, the, the robot, voiced by Anthony Hopkins, I think that maybe he's talking about this princess, Princess Issa, um, as kind of being this like prophetic person to rule in, in this myth, right? And uh, maybe that is who Kor is, perhaps. Um, maybe she was you know, kind of like a Luke and Leia type deal, right, where they were. Uh, taken away from from their family from from you know from Pat, Padme past and and Anakin was becoming Darth Vader and all that so they were kind of put into hiding perhaps that is the case with with this one as well and she just doesn't remember who she is and has to relearn that I don't know I'm just purely speculating here but uh, that is the official teaser trailer Rebel Moon I did love the concept of like a myth can you know galvanize everybody right uh, beyond just just uh, uh, you know stories matter. Our words matter, the representations of them matter, and that is uh, how how we create culture. That's how we create a society. That's how we band together underneath uniform ideals is through the power of myth. And that's straight from the mouth, uh, not from the mouth per se, but from the, the, the spirit of Joseph Campbell, which is... As he said, George Lucas's best student, and <laughs> and or George Lucas has said that, or Joseph Campbell has said that George Lucas is his best student, and then he took that into Star Wars. So <clears throat> that's where we get the whole hero's journey of it all, and and all that. So let's move on to the official trailer, which you can again find on YouTube. Just search Rebel Moon trailer, and you'll see Rebel Moon Part One: A Child of Fire official trailer. It's about three minutes and three seconds. So. I'm going to give me a second to pull that up and uh, or whatever list viewing site of choice that you have, whether it be YouTube or some other site. I don't know. Maybe you watch videos on Twitter or Instagram. 
something like that, maybe TikTok even. And uh, once you're there, let's get ready to hit play. So I'm going to do uh, a little countdown again. Five, four, three, two, one, hitting play. Interesting. You found her in a ship, it sounds like. Maybe she was stranded there and then forced to l learn to love the people. I don't know. Yeah, it's Modoc. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's probably an empire group. They want everything. They want all the resources. They want slave labor, probably. Yeah, CGI is off the, off the, the charts for this one. Yeah, they won't just kill you. They'll brutally massacre a few, and then the rest will be forced into hard labor. Probably other terrible things, too, with that. Look at Cora kicking butt. I think I'm going to put together a team. <laughs> Yeah, it's God of War, all right. Yeah, yeah. Director of Zack Snyder's Justice League 2. Batman v Superman. Dawn of Justice. Charlie Hunnam. He's going to be part of this super team. You know, definitely Seven Samurai stuff. Jimon Hansu. Dance of Redemption. We are just slowly picking up these people that are, <laughs> that, uh, are looking for something, right? They're, they're fragmented pieces trying to make good in the world again. Band of Rebels, if you will. Yeah, there's Darian Bloodaxe, Gray Fisher. We saw the movie apparently a couple days ago, and he loved it. Wow. Again, the visuals are off the charts on this one. I know Zach's already done with the picture. Look at Darian and Blood Axe literally jump in there. I believe Ray, that's actually a practical, not necessarily a practical, but like the jump is practical, which is pretty cool. At least from what I've heard on, online. So take it with a grain of salt. I wonder why uh, Jimmy the Robot's wearing um, the horns. Like, a, like deer antler horns. I don't know. Anywho, that was the full trailer. Uh, part one, A Child of Fire for Rebel Moon. Again, part two will come out in April, and part one will come out in uh, December 22nd here. So almost a month away at this point, which is really exciting uh, for for Rebel Moon. I can't wait for it. I hope that you're already at home for it, too. I think it's going to be a very good, very good movie and excited to dive into the deeper themes of it all and just discuss the movie like we would for any other movie here on Force Ghost Conversations. We're also going to do this for other adjacent things for Star Wars, too, like the creator, too, can fit into that mold, uh, which I saw recently and absolutely loved, a Gareth Edwards Helmed film, which also had effects done by ILM and Lucasfilm. So you don't want to miss out on, on those future discussions, too. So stay subscribed to Forest Ghost Conversations. You can find us on all social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok. I think I said Instagram, but if I didn't, I'm saying it again. And just search Force Ghost Conversations and we'll be there in some capacity. Uh, again, if you want to support the show via other means, a simple subscription to us on any podcast platform goes a long way. You can leave a rating and review too because that helps us to find new listeners who are interested in the stuff that we do, the cozy deep dive discussions of it all. You can also support the show monetarily as well with uh, a subscription to our Patreon for as little as one dollar a month. You can ac you can get access to a ton of Force Ghost Conversations goodies, such as uh, extra episodes. You can get uh, you can ask questions to be answered on the show. You can share stories on the show. All that fun stuff is available, uh, and just search for the tier that you find the most applicable for how you want to support the show. We also have a T Public store where you can buy merchandise for Force Ghost Conversations, where we have our Indiana Jones inspired logo, our Star Wars inspired logo, and our Willow inspired logo. And we have t shirts, hoodies, 
uh, pillows, iPhone cases. There's a whole plethora of stuff. So if you got a fan of Forest Coast Conversations in your life, I know they're running sales pretty regularly for the holiday season on Tee Public. So just search for Forest Coast Conversations and you'll find us on that site. So until then, folks, we'll be back next week with a brand new episode talking about episode two of Ahsoka. And until then, may the Force be with you. Take care. Thank you.